for studying whole strain dynamics. And in fact, uh, we saw that it is difficult to uh, properly formulate the canonical approach if you have constraints in the system and in particular <laughs> if uh, you have these uh, so-called constraints then uh, because you cannot invert all the momenta it, uh, it becomes uh, problematic you know, to define the Hamiltonian in the usual sense by just taking the standard legendar transform. Now, uh, I, I work through some examples this is, uh, to show that basically if you have what are called the free theories, because there are no constraints, and say the, any free field theory of the harmonic oscillator, then uh, you can quickly formulate the canonical uh, formulation and there is no problem in defining uh, the positive brackets and the associated equations of motion either in the Lagrangian or in the Hamiltonian frame. If there are constraints, and we uh, took a very simple example from point mechanics, and we could see that there were a lot of problems. And you could not actually consistently define uh, the Poisson uh, brackets which were compatible with the Hamiltonian and so on. So uh, as I told you, I will uh, give you a general discussion now. So first I give a specific example. Now we just uh, give a general discussion on uh, constraints so that uh, you know uh, you get familiar with the terminology and you are also able to work out problems. Okay, so this is just a general discussion. Now, <coughs> this is the definition of the canonical momenta where Q A are the coordinates and A is here takes values from 1, 2, 3, 4 to capital A. So A going uh, 1, 2, and we have the two A coordinates. And associated with each value of A, you have one okay. Now, if there are constraints, what does this mean? Basically, it means that there will be some relations where the momenta will not be expressed in terms of the velocity, right? So that particular velocity will not be inverted. You cannot express that velocity in terms of the momenta. So what does that mean? It means that there are certain relations between the coordinates and momenta. And what are these relations? They are the constraints of the system. So, so there are certain relations between the coordinates and the And the B runs A from 1 to B. And of course, B, I mean, will be less than or equal to A. Because this is the total number of variables. So B you cannot exceed A. And you cannot have uh, more constraints than you have more relations. So this, in general, is the best So I hope you get the meaning. These are the constraints of the system. And Dirac gave them further the name. These are actually called the primary constraints. This is a nomenclature given by Dirac. Why are they called primary? 
because they just follow from the definition of the canonical momentum. You need nothing else. No other input, no other calculation is required. They are the basic or the primary constraints. Nothing else is required. Now, I have further told you that the distinction between what is called the DM strong quality and in particular the constraints are always imposed with D. And what does that mean? That if you compute a Poisson bracket with this phi b, you cannot set phi b equal to zero inside the Poisson bracket. Only when you have computed all the Poisson brackets, then at the end of the analysis, you can set the constraint to zero. That's what is meant by weak equality. Strong quality, well, you can put it zero anywhere you like. Inside the Poisson bracket, outside the Poisson bracket, it doesn't matter. Okay. Now, two functions, suppose f and g are we can say f and g are weakly identical. So the notation is like this, that is f and g are weakly identical and then the difference is strongly equal to a linear combination of the constraints. This should be intuitively clear if you do not understand this in it. Why this relation happens? This happens because <coughs> I have just told you the meaning of the weak equivalence. So therefore, you see, if you take the bracket of this, and you take the bracket, say, of this with some question, you take the bracket of this with some question, This, have you understood this or not? This you should understand because this you see is weak is equal to, if you put G, if you take G on this side, then what does it mean? This is equal to G plus this. Then what does it mean? It only means that the difference has to be equal to just this because otherwise you don't get the weak trying to think, what is the weak equivalence? This, unless you understand this, it's a bit difficult to uh, conceptually visualize the whole thing. If this is strongly equal to this, then f minus g is what? Zero. Okay? If this is weakly, this, it only means that it can be strongly equal to the constraint. Because as I have told you, if this is just weakly zero, the square of this is always strongly zero. Yes. Uh, the square of a constraint is always strongly zero because if you take the algebra with anything, 
then you see one of the five goes out it's like this okay something like this but you cannot forget this part because this is sitting outside this goes to zero so the difference is just modulo of the constraint <coughs> Algebra of the constraints vanishes weakly. What does it mean? This is weak is zero. The right hand side is zero. So you should be able to express it right. Yeah. It's a combination of the constraints. Let that point. This is the reason that you can express this difference as a combination of the constraints. Is it clear or not? I say that the causal bracket of the constraints is weakly zero. Then what does that mean? I can now put this strongly equal to equal to what? It was some structure F. You get this point or not? You got this? Because you see this thing is itself what? Weekly zero. This is weekly zero. And because this is weekly zero automatically this holds. Therefore this is strongly equal to this. If the algebra satisfies a property like this, what do we call? We call this that the algebra is closed. This is like the Lie algebra. The algebra is closed. This repeats itself to the right hand side. If the constraint satisfies an algebra like this, or its algebra is closed, we call this to be the first class constraint. FCC. <coughs> Have you followed this? Huh? You are not there. <laughs> so, what happened in the last class? Where? What is your name? Alkan. Alkan. You are working? Hello. The class is there, man. Okay. So, Mr. Ankan, have you followed this? I told you first class question. First class question. If the algebra does not satisfy this closure property, it's called second class Likewise, this, uh, by the way, uh, nomenclature, uh, everything is of course due to, due to Dirac, is there in his book. Not the standard book on quantum mechanics, but he has another small book called Lectures on Quantum Mechanics, Yeshiva University Lecture Series, which he gave. Uh, 
So likewise you will call f any function f will be called the first class function provided is weakly zero or then strongly like this. That's all. So any function f will be called the first class function if its algebra with the constraints closes. So d is zero is strong. Otherwise this function will also be called the second class function. Now we come to a very important property of first class functions, namely also bracket of two first class functions is also first class. Poison bracket of two first class functions is also first class and the proof is very simple. So let me take a function f this is what I just wrote. And another function so g <laughs> f and g are two first class functions. Then you take the Poisson bracket of f to g and then to check if it is first class or not you have to take the bracket with the constraint phi a, that's what you have to do. Okay. Now you use the Jacobi identity of this double Poisson bracket to rewrite it as follows. And then you will also substitute it for that relation. bracket of g with f that is immaterial because outside there is a constraint sitting. In fact, you can put equal to 0, so that doesn't count. Therefore, you are interested only in the algebra of this with this because this is inside. Then this goes out and you have phi a prime with f. That you can you just write it from there, you will have another minus that gives you plus and a prime, a double prime, by a prime. The same logic applies to this case also, and you have a minus. Okay. 
now you can take the five prime outside and you can take the bracket so this is the new structure and therefore this is also for stars because you have managed to express the algebra as something times a constraint therefore the this is a very important as a lot once again to but it out is there we had a lot of analysis in this topic and this is a very useful way that the Poisson bracket of the first class will be the first class. <coughs> now, so you already know the difference now between what a first class object is and a second class object is. So, let us proceed. the definition so you are to start with a given Lagrangian you compute the <coughs> canonical momenta corresponding to all the coordinates in the Lagrangian and then if you see that there are no constraints then everything is fine you don't need all this analysis as for instance in the harmonic oscillator and you can quickly go to the canonical formulation give you the Hamiltonian, the one particle state and so on. On the other hand, if you find that there are constraints as I have just shown, then it is actually problematic to define the canonical Hamiltonian itself. So the first thing is that you have to appropriately define, define what? The Hamiltonian. And this was once again done by Dewar. <coughs> so what he did was like this. It defines what's called now a total Hamiltonian, which is denoted by H T. This is the original canonical Hamiltonian, which you were unable to define, but which you will now be able to define in this way. I, I, I will now explain that. If the HT exists, then there is a method of getting the HC, but by itself there is no HC. Just to come to that. Plus, prime constraints. Yeah? So you find the primary constraints of the system and you introduce them through the Lagrange model okay. and you write this to be the total Hamiltonian but this is what you earlier could not define but now you can the reason is because earlier you were not being able to invert the velocities and so on and so forth but all that ambiguity which you could not force you to define this. This all this ambiguity is actually thrown here into this term. It's thrown into this term. How it works? Well, let me just then uh, give you the very simple example of what's called the Maxwell theorem. I mean, all of you, you should know the Maxwell theorem. You know the Maxwell theorem. You don't. You studied the Maxwell. Uh, yeah, master. <laughs> Your face tells that you have master. You study? Thanks with you. The simplest of all things, but the most remarkable. Now you see, the, the momentum conjugate to A0 doesn't because there is no A0 dot term. Okay. 
taken, there is no A0 dot term here. So this is actually zero. This is actually zero. <coughs> now if you write the try to write the Legendre transform, how will you write? You will write pi zero a zero dot plus pi i a i dot right minus your L. Okay. And then you really do not know how to proceed because if you set this equal to zero by hand, then your a zero dot turn just goes out. So pi zero a zero dot turn just goes out. Okay. But the question is, one could also say that I could write some things in the Hamiltonian as hundred multiplied by pi zero. This is zero. So I will retain it. I will retain it. And that, of course, gave Dirac this insight. He interprets this as what? As a constraint. Because there is no corresponding velocity. This is a primary constraint. Okay? So this will occur there. So you see, the so called canonical Hamiltonian. Plus, this will be what? Plus u0 pi 0. This is this term is u0 pi 0. Then you are through. Because this is completely undetermined. This freedom. This is completely undetermined. We don't know what happens. Then there is no problem. Whether you set this equal to 0 or not, I don't care. You could as well write it just as pi 0 a 0 dot. Because the pi zero a zero dot term you can even throw it in here. The u zero contains within it the a zero dot term because it's not by Therefore, you can, when you define the total Hamiltonian, there is no problem. But this is possible only when you have this field. Okay, so you see that this is therefore written in course because really, for a constraint system. Uh, the canonical Hamilton really doesn't make any sense at all. Right. So it is this particular Hamiltonian with which we are interested, and in computing this HC, you are now free to set the pi zero a zero dot term equal to zero because this freedom is, is already here. And here you can set the pi zero equal to zero. There is no problem now. Because it is here, it's shifted there. So this has an explicit form. Nothing is undetermined in this factor. Whatever is undetermined is in this factor. This will naturally modify modify the Hamilton's equations of motion. The Hamilton's equations are written as keeping a dot are now expressed in terms of. This, this, you know, is Hamilton equation. So now you have to write this as just to change the indices of the terms. Is it clear? Or it's not clear, it's clear. Once again, you will see that when you take the, the derivative, <coughs> I have not taken a derivative on the lambda because the phi a just sits outside. Huh? So that is dropped. The equation of motion is basically taking the Poisson bracket over the Hamilton. Therefore, you are free to drop this term. This means that the Poisson bracket has been taken and gives you this answer. So therefore I, you see the, the whole point is here. This is non zero. This is non zero. And the derivative can even send it. But if you do this, the derivative is unknown because this is a multiplier, but the point is multiplied by something which is zero. And therefore Dirac can say it doesn't need to compute this object. Whatever is necessary in the equation of motion can be computed. Modulo is free. 
Likewise, you can compute what? You can compute your PA dot and this will be minus we have to supplement it by this. this is the whole set of equations. The whole set of Hamilton's equations is this. Okay? This three equations comprise the complete set of Hamilton's equations of motion in the presence of constraints. So why have you replaced lambda by huh? why did you change? Oh no no, this is you can put lambda. We can put lambda also. Okay. So now we go. So we have find the primary constraints, we have classified them into first and second class, we have defined a new Hamiltonian which is called the total Hamiltonian, this is Hc, plus all the primary constraints irrespective of whether these are first class or second class, all the primary constraints have to be introduced here and this is my set of equations of motion. Now comes the uh, requirement. This is the famous consistency requirement. So, <clears throat> so what is the consistency requirement? It means that if you have a constraint, that should be preserved in time. Otherwise, it has no meaning. I mean, the system to begin with a certain constraint, then that should be preserved in time, but that means as it evolves, that constraint should be there. It's not that it changes to something else. So, what does it mean? It means that the time conservation should vanish. How do you compute the time conservation? Is you have to take the bracket with the Hamiltonian. And what is the Hamiltonian here? It's the total Hamiltonian. So, this will give us three possibilities. When you compute the consistency requirement, that is phi A, HT must be weakly zero. Right? All that we need is that the constraint should be time conserved at least on the constraint shell, on the constraint surface. So, so you have put weakly zero. Huh? So you have put weakly zero. Why not strongly zero? No. All you see, as I have just told you, all these equations, although they are written like this, <coughs> when you take the bracket with the total Hamiltonian, they are all weak brackets, because eventually you are dropping the, this term. You follow? If you take the strong bracket, then what does it mean? You can't take the strong bracket, then this term would not contribute at all. The constraints are always imposed weakly, and this equation, as it is written here, is actually taking the weak bracket with the total amount. If you take the strong bracket, it means that this term will never contribute. It will just drop. Therefore, 
Effectively, when I have written all this, it's basically the weak bracket, always the weak bracket. The weak bracket. Right. So there can be three possibilities. The one is the trivial possibility. Zero weekly zero. That is, you compute the left hand side and you get zero. So that's trivial. That is zero. So of course, it's obviously weekly zero. What to do? Zero. Nothing to do. Then two. Fixes us the multiple. Now how, how does it fix the multiple? Next. side we get this and once again you see that the algebra of phi with lambda doesn't matter because phi u prime goes up and that term is zero and drops down. Right. Now of course you see that if if this bracket which I have written is weakly zero by itself then this is gone then lambda cannot be fixed. First class is first class Right. If this is a first class constraint, then lambda will not be fixed. Okay? And that is why we call the first class theory to be a gauge theory. The freedom cannot be fixed. That is a gauge theory. This shows up from the last analysis. Okay? So if we have the first class constraint, in the maximum theory, the pi zero is a first class constraint. You cannot therefore fix the multiple. There is a freedom in the equations of motion, therefore, and it's a theory. It comes out very nicely. You cannot fix it. On the other hand, if the constraint is second class, then this is not weakly zero. This is something. And then, of course, it basically means that this is invertible. And then, of course, you can compute your lambda gate prime. So for a second class system, the multiplier is fixed by this equation. So So this is the other possibility, that if you have second class constraints, you will be able to determine your lambda and consequently your complete total Hamiltonian is determined. Then the last possibility, third, where well this is the, the possibility that is possibility can occur is suppose this is first class so this term goes out 
and this time gives me gives me something. It will be some function of the coordinates and the momenta. And that has to be zero. But the relation between coordinates and momenta, which is e equal to zero, with equal to zero, is a constraint. So this is a new constraint of the system. And this is being generated by the primary constraint, by the time conservation of the primary constraint, and it is called the secondary constraint. So the there could be an instance when this is weekly zero, so this goes out, and this is not weekly zero, this is some some finite thing which is a function of the coordinates and momenta. On the right hand side is to be weekly zero. Then what is that? There is a relation which tells that there is a, some condition between the coordinates and momenta, and this is a, a new condition which comes out from the consistency or the compatibility from the preservation of the first class condition, the time preservation of the first class condition, first class primary condition. And this is called the secondary constraint. So now you learn that the primary constraint, which it, it could be both first and second class, if it is a second class, then that will fix the multiplier. Okay? If it is a first class constraint, then there could be two possibilities. One possibility would be that, well, the whole left hand side is trivially zero, gone. But there could be another possibility that the whole left hand side is not trivially zero. It's, it's some functions of the Q's and the B's, which does not involve the lambda. And that is the new constraint, and that's called the secondary constraint. And this process has to be iterated. When you get the secondary constraint, you have to again take its time conservation. Otherwise, there is no meaning. It also has to be time preserved. So once again, you have to take its algebra with HD. Once again, <coughs> there will be three possibilities. You go on. And this iterative process will stop when you come to this point. Because then it ends. And you get your complete structure of the constraints, all the constraints. So you have now understood the meaning of what's called the primary and the secondary, of all the constraints which generated from the secondary, sometimes called the tertiary, but then most people avoid this. Anything, there's two class, you have primary, and subsequently all sort of constraints are called secondary. And you have another distinction which is called the first class and the second. Even amongst these, you, even among the second, secondary, you can again have this distinction of first class and second class, and so on and so forth. But when you have determined your full constraint structure, then you have to perform the algebra. You have to take the algebra of the whole set of constraints and then see which are first class and which are second class. So suppose you have 5, 1, 5, 2, 5, 3, 5. You find that the algebra of phi 1 closes with all, then that is what? That's a first class. Algebra of phi 2 doesn't close with all. It closes, say, with phi 1 and phi 3, but doesn't close with phi 4. It's a second class. By the same logic, phi 4 would also be second class because it doesn't close with phi 2 and so on. So you have to, this is called the famous classification of the constraint. That's not an easy task always. In simple models is okay, but particularly in gravitational models it is very difficult to classify the whole set of constraints. Okay. So I think I will stop at this point. Right? So I have given you the Hamiltonian, the classification of the constraints. So this is a completely general discussion. Nothing to do with any models or anything. Although it's written in Point mechanics form, but uh, nothing prevents you from doing field theory or anything. Only thing is, you have to be a bit more careful with the indices, that's why you have to appropriately the space time uh, index will come. 
But that's only a technical point. There's no new concept. Hey, are you following this or not? Huh? Following this? Are you not there? You see, the point is, uh, you should work it out. You should do uh, work, uh, work it out on your own. Sometimes you might feel that you are understanding the thing, but uh, it may so happen that you have not understood it. So it's better to actually practice it. I will proceed in the third class also with certain general discussion, and in the fourth one I will work through a very specific example, the Maxwell theory. So there is uh, one question I asked, only one. So when you um, take the strong equality, um, why do you consider that the subsequent thing on the right hand side is only linear in phi? It obviously doesn't matter classically. You can have phi squared, phi cube, phi four. No, I told you that the definition of the constraint surface. Huh? Right. So if phi equals zero is my constraint surface, then it will not be the phi square equal to right, zero. It, is a it's constraint. meaningless in that sense. But it's when you not go to a quantum theory code. No, not even in quantum theory, because you have to first here define the classical theory and in quantum theory phi square actually has no meaning. Okay. So it's because there are ordering square. problems, there are ordering ambiguities and so on. And you have to appropriately do that. Phi square really has no meaning. But it's not summed over the same phi, right? I mean it can be phi one, phi two. Yeah, but you cannot write phi 1, phi 2, you can have n number of orderings. I can write phi 1, phi 2, I can have phi 2, phi 1, I can write phi 1, phi 2 plus yes. phi 2, phi 1, phi 2 or whatever I like. So there is no meaning to the product. Yeah? So you just keep it linear. And that actually gives you an essential handle on how you can interpret the phi as the generator of the gauge transformation. Effectively, you can subsequently see that this phi is really the generator of the gauge transformation. 